Water B propulsion team, and their project is called Project Hestia. So who knows what that means? Anybody? No Greek background? It means Earth, right? God saw Earth, fireplace. So you look, we're learning a lot of um, history today, aren't we? Uh, so you're going to talk about the afterburner which they built, the design and built. I'm going to hand it over to Katie, who's going to introduce her team. Hello there. As Professor Aksha said, we are at Delta B Propulsion and we made Project Hestia. So our team members include myself. I am the design team lead. I'm also <coughs> the sub team lead for the design and safety sub team and the budget. Next, we have Troy Fenner, who worked on fabrication, air breathing, and advanced crop um, testing, and the redesign that we went through earlier this semester. Next, we have Karina who worked on the instrumentation of data acquisition and testing primarily. Next we have Matthew Siegel, who worked on prototyping and testing, everything in advanced propulsion, CAD, and the redesign. And then Justin White, who did CAD, heat transfer, fabrication, testing, and the redesign that we all worked on. So an introduction to our project. So project overview. Project Hestia is a multiple configuration afterburner. So as you can see in the picture, we went from a four inch inlet down 53 and a half inches to an eight inch by eight inch square exit. So the reason that it was 53 and a half inches long is it had to fit all of our sections that we'll talk about later inside of it. As you can see on the right is the physical um, afterburner that we actually constructed as a comparison to the CAD model. So the need for this project, um, we wanted it to be a teaching tool primarily so that students can go into the propulsion lab, look at it, see what happens when you move something around, how does an afterburner work, so it's not just equations that we get, we can actually see how it does what it does. Um, also, we were thinking it might be used for future undergraduate research if another team comes along and decides that they want to see how changing something about an afterburner affects anything, they could just take our um, project and move the sections that are shown below around however they want to because everything is the same dimensions. So they just slot together and the bolt is, is shown over there. Um, so it's very modular and <coughs> around however you need to for the given test that you want to perform. So then project goals. Um, we were hoping to find the relationship between altering the flame holder configuration um, with the blockage ratio, the force to the drag, and the flame stability. So how these goals were accomplished, we performed a couple series of tests. We did uh, several theoretical tests and then several physical tests. So for theoretical, we did computational fluid dynamics and then um, particle imaging velocimetry. And then for the physical, we did a blower output test, a honeycomb test to see what was happening after we installed the honeycomb section, um, because at that point it was no longer just the blower outputs. And then we conducted a non-fire test, which was just a test run of everything before we ignited, and then we attempted a live fire test, but we could not get the mission. So objectives we wanted to have it be variable geometry. So as you can see, the flame holders are in two different positions between the two pictures. So that's achieved simply by, if you look up here, you can just slide them along the ledge and they're in a new position. So, and then in order to find the relationships that I was talking about earlier, we wanted to be able to measure temperature, pressure, and velocity. So we were using tech K thermocouples, an absolute pressure transducer, a differential pressure transducer and a water cooled pitot tube. As you can see in the figure in Figure T, that is the location of everything except for the differential and the water cooled pitot tube because those were located outside of the area of the afterburner, so it's not included in this picture. So, another objective is we wanted to be able to vary our flow rate of air, so we decided to go with a Power Powerjet F700 electric blower, so what we blur. Um, so you 
in order to change the flow rate of the air, you simply just turn the knob on it and you ran some tests, as I mentioned earlier, so that you knew what setting led to what flow rate. And then we also wanted a variable flow rate for a fuel source, so propane, because you can simply turn the valve that we installed on one of the propane houses and then monitor it with a rotor meter to get the new flow rate of the propane. I will now pass it off to Troy Fenner to talk about the design. So I'll be going over the design of the afterburner, and these were the theoretical design things that were taken into consideration at the beginning. So for the inlet, the biggest thing that we had to take into consideration were the losses because we are going from a four inch to an eight inch square. So we went with a 9.2 degree of diffusion angle. This was decided upon using the graph on the screen. So as you can see by the red line, a nine degree angle gives you the minimal amount of losses. <coughs> the small angle, however, negatively affected the overall design of the afterburner because it made the inlet extremely long. So that's why we went with a 3D printed design because we were going from a circle to a square and we had to get that length in the system overall. So the blockage ratio. Now the blockage ratio affects the overall functionality of your afterburner. Now per recommended by Dr. Haven, you would like to have a block ratio between 0.21 and 0.417. Now using the D and H from our geometry and our design, we found that our theoretical blockage ratio would be 0.375. Now the D value is the height of the uh, flame holder and the H is the channel height. So in this system, there are two channels. So for the eight inches, you would have two channels of four inches each. So each different flame holder would have their own blockage ratio, and that's why we predicted that altering the flame holders would create different blockage ratios. Now for effects of the drag coefficient. So using the D, W, and H geometries from our theoretical design, we found that our drag coefficient would be 1.95. Now the drag coefficient uh, affects the total pressure, then the density, and the exit velocity. Now the W is not the same as the D value, even though it looks that way in the diagram. The W is the overall height of your recirculation zone and of your wake, while the D is the value, once again, of the flame holder itself. Now for blowout conditions. It is important when designing an afterburner to have a blowout, or excuse me, a stay time which is greater than your blowout time. Your stay time is the amount of time that the flame front stays in the system. So the flame front is indicated by the blue arrow on the diagram. This is where your ignition point and your flame will start. Now, the blowout time is a result of the recirculation zone indicated in orange. This is where the air circulates and you need to have a blowout time which results in how long your fuel remains at the blue point. So basically with our geometry and our theoretical velocities, we were able to calculate a theoretical blowout condition. Now, if you were working on a large scale afterburner, you would take into consideration the uh, chemistry side of things and how the fuel is gonna interact with the air. But for these tests, we went for a simple geometry and theoretical values calculations to design the afterburner. Now using the manufacturer of the blower's values, we came up with a theoretical exit static temperature. As you can see on the top of the screen, those are the possible maximum and minimum temperatures that could have been produced by this afterburner. <coughs> now we did not plan to test to our maximum because that would cause issues with the metals that we were using. So we're gonna test within an intermediate range between these two values. Now the maximum temperature was produced or would have been produced at the lowest blower setting. This is because with the lower velocity, you would have a lower mass flow rate, which in the equation would affect a smaller M dot total, which then would produce a higher exit temperature at the end of your system. Now for the exit velocities. It was found that the highest exit velocity possible would be produced with the highest uh, inlet velocity, as well as a maximum amount of fuel. Now the two reasons for this is first, if you have a high inlet velocity, you have a high V1. So for that equation, you would have a higher V3. Now for the max amount of fuel. With the max amount of fuel, you would be able to produce 
a higher temperature. Higher temperature would then result in a lower density of air at the exit. This lower density of air would then come into play in the ratio of density one to density three, resulting in a higher exit velocity. Now, Dr. Haven, we found that total pressure does reduce itself throughout the system. So for the exit total pressure, it is lower than the inlet total pressure. Now the dotted line on the graph indicates the pressure, total pressure at station one. Now as you can see that as fuel is added to the system, the total pressure drops throughout the system, meaning that you would then get changes at the exit of your afterburner. Now for the pros and cons of uh, altering the flame holders. Now if you decrease the blockage ratio, the pros would be a decrease in drag coefficient, which would then result in a decrease of exit pressure, a decrease in your exit air density, and ultimately an increase in your exit velocity. Now the cons to this, which Matt will touch on a little bit later, we found to be true, are that it will decrease the internal velocity, so that is the V2. So a decrease in internal velocities would then affect your stay time. Now this stay time would then become closer and closer and closer to your blowout conditions. So if you alter the flame holders too much, you would get a blowout. So when designing a large scale afterburner, you're going to want to be able to change your blockage ratio in a way that you're still able to get the maximum exit velocity while still maintaining a range where you will still get flame ignition. I'll now pass it off to Justin White to go over physical setup. As Troy just mentioned, I'll be going over the physical setup and the actual realization of our project. For our project, we ended up deciding upon six different pieces or individual parts to go throughout the project. Each one of these could be replaced or swapped out for future projects or testing groups, so we designed it with that in mind. For the overall assembly, starting at the entrance of the flow at your top left, ending at the bottom right, we have an inlet followed by a honeycomb section, followed by a window section, flame holder assembly, the flame holders themselves that were inserted into that assembly, and ending the flow in the project with a heat chamber. The overall dimensions and the driving factors behind this geometry throughout it was the blower itself would have a three inch exit, so we wanted a four inch entrance to the project so that it could be inserted in, so that we wouldn't lose any flow from that. And the total length of 26.5 inches, as Troy mentioned earlier, was driven by the fact we wanted a 9.22 degree diffusion angle so that we would have minimal losses through this section. The next section was the honeycomb section in which we created four inches long. The reason behind that is the honeycomb we decided upon had a 1 8 inch inner cell diameter to help promote laminar flow and help remove any undesired vortices. So we had this section be four inches long so that it could be easily inserted and then attached to the section before and after. Following this in the window section is five inches long. We decided upon this piece to be one of the three by three inch viewing window and an inch on either side so it could be easily attached to sections before or after it. After this for the flame holder assembly, we needed two six by three inch slots cut into each side so that the flame holders themselves could be inserted and then adjusted a full flame holder length to the back and ending with the heat chamber. The driving geometry behind this is we calculated a recirculation zone, and we needed this to completely encase the future theoretical possible recirculation zones we would have. The overall building material had a main material we used, which was a 316 stainless steel 16 gauge sheet metal. This material was used in every single section, excluding the <coughs> itself. The reason we chose this material has three different parts, mainly time, it is a material in which we can easily manufacture and weld here on campus. Secondarily, cost is a material in which we can buy within our budget. And the most important factor of all of them is the service temperature attached to this metal, which is 1,841 degrees Rankine. What the service temperature of this material refers to is the highest temperature in which a manufacturer recommends for it to be used under a steered extent under extended periods of time so that it does not lose its heat treatment and therefore the material properties do not change. To put this in perspective, the maximum theoretical testing temperature we were looking at on the first test campaign was 1610 degrees ranking. So it would be able to easily survive due to it can survive above the test 
above the surface temperature, but it also maintains all physical properties of this. The special materials we used throughout this afterburner, starting at the entrance of the flow, which is the inlet, was an ABS 3D printed plastic, which it had a surface temperature of 630 degrees Rankine. While you will notice this is much lower than our theoretical testing temperature, I'll go over how we address that worry in the next couple slides. Following this, we used an aluminum honeycomb, which had a surface temperature of 761 degrees Rankine. After that, a piece of boar silicate glass, which is more commonly known as Pyrex. The reason behind the, choosing this material is its ability to resist corrosion as well as fogging when exposed to combustion particulates at a higher temperature. The surface temperature attached to this material was 1,355 degrees Rankine. The final special material that we used was Inconel for the flame holders themselves. Inconel has a surface temperature of 2,080 degrees Rankine. Why we use this material is so that these could survive any future possible tests, as well as easily survive the testing campaign that we have planned. The reason we were able to use these is they were donated to us by Professor Garakisa. For the location of the materials, as you can see over here, is we start with the 3D printed ABS plastic. If followed by that, we have each section made of the stainless steel 316. In, you have the window section, which is actually on the other side, which you can't see right this second, but you can't see in the picture above, and followed by the ink and pieces right here. What we use to combine these different pieces is that the inlet is actually designed to where it fits onto the, the honeycomb section itself and then was able to be HVAC taped onto there. And each of the other sections are bolted as well as HVAC taped together so that it can prevent flow seepages between the pieces. The reason for this combination, as I said earlier, is so any future groups that wish to use any part of this apparatus for testing can easily swap out any section for a larger window or honeycomb or have a different style inlet for a different flow generator. As I said previously, with a lot of our materials, the main part that we were worried about was the heat generation through the project. Whenever we did the first thermal analysis of this project, we found that due to convection, induction, and the inlet, which has the lowest surface temperature, which is the main part we were worried about, only generated <coughs> about half a degree of ranking. So we considered this negligible and considered and continue to look at mainly only the radiation that would be generated throughout this project. As you can see on the left is the heat that would be generated at the inlet at the inlet exit due to radiation versus the testing temperature for the testing campaign throughout it. On the left, you can see the cooling due to convection due to, from two different equations that were used. First, the bottom line in green is the Dittus Bolter equation, which is considered a more conservative equation and where we planned our first test campaign to be underneath. We also did a second equation, which is the Ganinsky's correlation, which is considered to be more accurate by a lot of the research that was done by the team. And so that if we were able to continue on to a second testing campaign, we would be able to increase the testing temperatures, but still have a safe margin of safety. On this slide, we did a visual representation of the safer areas for testing. On the right, you'll see the heat generation versus the cooling that was done by the Dispolter equation at the lowest testing velocity our blower was able to match, which will show you that we would be able to safely test up to 1,750 degrees ranking without the inlet or the ABS plastic increasing in temperature whatsoever. On the right is the same graphic, but using the dis using the Ganinsky's correlation for future testing campaigns. This slide is a repeat of the previous slide, except the difference being this is the maximum in which the floor we chose, the cooling that it would be allowed to, which increases the testing that we'd be able to do about 250 degrees Rankine. Just to recap of how we were giving our information for the different tests, at the entrance of the blower, we had an absolute pressure transducer so that we would have our theoretical values to compare. We would have our actual numbers to be compared to our theoretical values. Moving along the afterburner on all the red squares, we had type K thermocouples to measure the increase of temperature caused by the afterburner itself. I would like to mention that at the exit of the blower, the top 
red block shows that a thermal couple is coming in from the top. The one below it shows that a thermal couple is coming in from each of the sides so that we can average the exit temperature. Below that is the water-cooled pitot tube, which we would be able to adjust the length of how much it went into the afterburner itself to get velocities at different stages. The two underneath it that are external is we had a differential pressure transducer that was attached to the end of the pitot tube to help us calculate our velocities, as well as a rotometer that was attached to our propane tank, allowing us to adjust the air-to-fuel mixture accurately. I'll now pass it off to Matthew Siegel to go over the theoretical testing of this semester. So the first tests that we performed were computational fluid dynamics analyses. Uh, we used the fluent analysis system in ANSYS workshops to complete these. These tests gave us theoretical flow visualization and velocity values through our flame holder assembly. And we tested both or we tested our both of our configurations at station two for the velocities. The first CFD tests we completed were simulations of our water tunnel tests that we performed later on in the year. The tests show a couple fundamentals of fluid mechanics. First of all, that there is a velocity increase along our flame holder walls as the cross-sectional area decreases, and also that eddies form after our flame holders, as is expected with flow across a bluff body. These CFD uh, tests were compared with our water tunnel tests, obviously, later for the year. We also completed CFD tests for our live fire and non-fire simulation or uh, tests that we also perform later in the year. We wanted to see that uh, recirculation zones were formed after each of our flame holders uh, for both configurations <coughs> at both of our testing uh, velocities. As you can see from our figures shown above, uh, all of our uh, tests no matter what configuration or test velocity, we would have recirculation zones which would allow us to, uh, in theory, maintain our flame stability throughout our tests. The second thing is, or to note is that, from what Troy said earlier, we predicted that we would have a velocity decrease from switching our flame holders or changing the position of one of our flame holders. As you can see, the, uh, for configuration one, the maximum velocity at station two here at the end of our flame holders is 520.9 inches per second for configuration one at the lowest inlet velocity we expected to have. For configuration two, the maximum velocity was 508 inches per second, about 12 inches per second slower than uh, in configuration one, which supports our prediction from earlier. We also wanted to see how changing the flame holder position affected the recirculation zones in general, since figures for this theor theory are not uh, available and are very unique to our tests in general. So as you can see the, in configuration two, the flame holder that is not repositioned has a recirculation zone that has been con contracted due to the increase in pressure from the top flame holder. This then leads downstream to the second recirculation zone for the flame holder that was repositioned uh, and that recirculation zone is able to expand due to a decrease in the pressure at that stage. A couple things to note just for clarification. Um, our CFD tests were performed earlier in the semester and we decided to switch the flame holder that we repositioned due to 
placement of our instrumentation, which is why in these, the top flame holder is changed, whereas in all of the rest of our images, the bottom is changed instead. <coughs> and also, we, So comparing our CFD results with our uh, hand-calculated values, we can see that the CFD results strongly support what we expect from our uh, tests later on, as there is only a maximum of 5% difference for uh, whichever velocity we are using. The next series of tests that we performed were our particle image velocimetry tests using a water tunnel supplied or courtesy of Interactive Flow Studies Corporation, <coughs> which was called the Flow Coach Apparatus. These PIV tests allowed us to obtain real flow visualization through our flame holder assembly and which we would then use to confirm whether or not our CFD simulations were valid or not. To perform these tests, we 3D printed custom inserts to use for the apparatus itself so that they could fit inside the test compartment. We scaled our flame holder assembly down to that test compartment size and as as I speak about this, our inserts are being passed around. So, as I mentioned earlier, we had to scale our flame holder assembly down to fit inside of the test compartment. That means that we had to complete Reynolds number comparisons in order to see if we could directly compare our water tunnel and live fire uh, tests, which we were unable to do. As you can see, the Reynolds number for our water tunnel tests was only about 1,500 compared to what we expected at, for our live fire, which was almost 100,000 for our Reynolds number, meaning it was very true. So here's a video of our calibration test for the water tunnel apparatus. Um, this just gives you a visualization of what we were observing during these tests. And it also shows one error that we encountered um, during our experiment. As you can see, between the flame holders, there is a sh section that has a shadow cast on it by the solid walls of our flame holders. In order to gain valid data from our camera that was recording this, you need the entire insert to... <laughs> That's not actually what happened, but anyway. Um, you need the entire insert to be illuminated by the lights on either side of the test compartment so that the camera can actually see what's happening. But since that section was shadowed, the data collected in that region was completely wrong and we discarded it during our data analysis later on. So here's our data analysis and you can see the shadowed section has been blacked out. Um, the, we are comparing our PIV tests to our CFD tests in order to see whether or not um, our CFD tests accurately represent what will happen in real life. The comparisons between our velocities that were measured in our PIV support the same velocities corresponding to the same areas in our CFD tests. You will see that the velocities in the PIV tests are slightly uh, slower than the ones expected from our CFD but we can attribute this to a couple things, possibly in, um, imperfections in our 3D printed models, um, drag losses from the apparatus itself, 
And also, the apparatus needed to be um, hands, um, or the inlet velocity was adjusted by hand in order to get the testing velocity that we wanted to use. This could have been slightly off um, just from human error and not exactly what we were expecting, which would correspond to some change in the velocity itself. Um, but despite this, we still believe that uh, our PIB tests support our CFP and confirm that it is accurate. Just to give you a better visualization of what is occurring during our PIB tests, you can see the expected increase in velocity along our flame holder walls that I mentioned earlier, um, as indicated by the small, smaller velocity vectors here compared to the larger ones at the end. <coughs> Similarly, we also can see the eddies that we were expecting directly after the flame holders themselves. I will now hand it back over to Troy Benner to talk about our physical tests that we performed. So in the overall testing view of this project, we have already covered the theoretical testing that we have done. And I'll be moving on to the first physical test that we performed, the blower test. Now the blower test was meant to test the actual exit conditions of the blower that we would be using compared to what the manufacturer was presenting. So for the blower velocities, now lines on graphs do mean certain things, but for this presentation we decided to go for a dotted line being the theoretical values and the actual values being a straight solid line in order to differentiate which ones were which. So as you can see, the low theoretical value is a straight vertical, and the solid line is the actual measured data. Now for the low value, it was very close to what the manufacturer actually predicted. It was slightly too low for what was predicted for the high value, but the test still would have been able to operate. For the mass flow rate, the mass flow rate, as you can see on this graph, were near each other, however, they were not nearly as close as we would have liked them to be compared to what our theoretical calculated values were and our measured values. Now, the test, we believe, still would have ran with these mass flow rates out of the blower. After the blower testing, we moved on to testing the blower, inlet, and honeycomb all combined. As you can see, the measured values for velocities were actually higher than what was predicted during our calculations and our theoretical values for the low and high. Now, the issue in line with this project is the low and high mass flow rates through the system. Now, during our analysis at the beginning of this project, we believed and maintained that mass flow rate would become constant throughout the entire system. This is what then ran with our calculations for temperature and for our flow out times and circulation times. Now the issue then arises is that the measured values were extremely low compared to what we thought they were going to be. Now this we believe can be contributed to the fact that the inlet was not sealed as in we just left the plastic as it was coming out of the lab. We also only sealed the edges with HVAC tape, and we only sealed the welds with spot welds versus putting an, ex an entire weld on the whole thing. So leaks in the system and losses, or leaks in the system and losses of air through the plastic contributed to loss of mass. Then this mass would be not sufficient enough to mix with the fuel and create a good mixture of fuel to air to ignite in the recirculation zone. Another issue that would have presented, if we would have gotten a light, the temperatures would have been too extreme for this material due to the little mass flow to air. As you can see on the calculation I used, er or the equation I used earlier, the ma total mass flow rate would have been too low than what we were expecting, creating an extremely high temperature compared to what our theoretical temperature would have been. Now for the non-fire test overview, this is what we were talking about 
when it came to the inlet, blower, honeycomb, and a few of the other pieces. We did this to ensure that our instrumentation would work and to practice our testing procedures. We ran through these to check our lab view code and to make sure that everything was in place when we would move on to attempting a live fire test. I'll now pass it off to Karina for safety measures. In order to ensure this, the smoothness of our, all of our tasks, we created several team member roles. We, the team member roles that we created were a task director to notify safety and ensure that our safety, that all of our testing procedures were followed. We also had a, created a data acquisition operator position to run the lab view and uh, store our data. There's also a blower <coughs> operator to uh, adjust the match blow rate of the blower and a safety manager to ensure our safety during all of our testing. On this uh, graphic, you can see where the, the, those positions were in relation to the test rig. The test director is in front of the test stand so that they can get a good view of all of our tests. The da uh, data acquisition operator is also in front of the rig. That's where the computer was located. The blower operator sits beside the rig where we had the adjustment for the blower and our safety manager was off to the other side of the rig so that they could get a, a good view of the rig uh, that was a little bit different from that of the test director. Now I'm going to talk about a little bit uh, about what actually happened during our live fire testing. As Catherine mentioned earlier, our live fire testing, uh, we could not get the afterburner to light. However, we did try several solutions to uh, try and get it to light. Uh, between each solution that we attempted, we tried to light the afterburner on, on the lowest uh, setting the, of the blower and the highest setting of the blower, and we also tried to light it without the blower on to see if that would help. So the solutions that we attempted were we tried to replace the propane hose, we tried to replace the propane tank in case the propane tank had an issue with it, we tried uh, lighting it with the propane at both the, the lowest and the highest uh, uh, mass flow rates of uh, exit mass flow rates of propane. We also tried to fix the rotimeter because uh, we did notice in testing that the rotimeter wasn't measuring any mass flow rate. And then we also tried removing the rotimeter to see if there was a leak there and tried just running it without the rotimeter in the system. Unfortunately, none of these uh, solutions worked. Um, and we were unable to get the system to light. Uh, so now I'm going to hand it back to Catherine to talk about our budget. So the WD beforehand had a budget of $805. So we ended up spending about 526 of those on physical things, but we also had hypothetical costs such as labor and just materials that were donated to us. So the breakdown of our actual costs is the majority of them ended up going to the sheet metal um, and um, the gauntlets is the majority of our costs. As you can see, it's the green section. Um, right after that was the safety components, which included the propane fittings, things like that, making sure there weren't any leaks um, because some of our fittings weren't fitting, so we had to go and get new ones. Um, and then we also had a test stand. We decided to go and get uh, several cinder blocks, just concrete cinder blocks, to place between the afterburner and the table in the propulsion lab because we thought it would be bad if we accidentally 
Fisher at the table in the symposium. We thought that'd be a bad idea. Um, so back to the hypothetical cost that I was talking about. If we'd included these in our budget, we would have spent about $1,400 as opposed to our $800, which is a lot more. Um, so for the hypothetical costs, those include our econo pieces, um, like we mentioned previously. That would cost around $200 for just the materials based off of our calculations on paper prices. Um, then the ABS plastic, the rapid prototyping lab here on campus was kind enough to not charge us $195 for that. Um, so thank you to them. And then AxeFab was very nice and let us use their water jet and then they did all of the welding for us. Um, so for just the water jet cutting, it would have been about $140, and then for the welding, it would have been $300 because of time and equipment. Um, time. So I'm also going to go over labor hours that we've completed this semester. So as you can see on the graph, the, the straight line is our projected hours, and then the one that varies for our actual hours. You can see where we ran into snags and had less hours and so we projected that we would have 917 hours as of today. <coughs> we actually have 986, so we're about 0.07% off. Um, so our projection is actually very close, which means we were efficient with our time, as opposed to last semester where we were way over. So to break those hours down into types of work performed, um, the majority of our hours went to our technical work and to our report and presentation writing. That's the bulk of what we spent our time on this semester. Um, after that, we have testing and then paperwork and fabrication being the next highest ones. So in conclusions, we had a couple of design points that we ended up changing between last semester and this semester, including the flame holder connection points. Um, we ended up putting them on the end caps so that we could insert them through and then rest them on the ledges, which is the next point. And then the inlet sizing, it was three inches, but then we changed which flow we were using, so we had to increase it to four. And then the flow straightener of the honeycomb, we weren't originally going to do that, but then it was pointed out to us that the leaf blower probably has very choppy flow coming out of it. Um, so we decided to take that very good suggestion and include section in our assembly. So lessons learned. Um, we recommend streamlining the design process a little bit more. Um, try and get more feedback earlier in prelim. Don't wait until the presentation to get feedback from people other than just your professors and the people that you go and beg for help. Um, test earlier. Test more often. Test the instrumentation separately of itself. As soon as you can test something, do it. Um, clear communication, which is a problem for everybody. Um, and then, as Dr. Fabian was fond of saying, Murphy gets a vote. So just, no matter how much you plan, it's gonna happen. Um, and then, thank you to all these people, our professors, AxFab, the RPL, our classmates and peers for letting us pick their brains. So does anybody have any questions? We were measuring the mass flow rate of the propane uh, with the rotameter. Okay. Um, the rotameter, the principle on that is that it has uh, a tube that the flow is fed through. Mm -hmm. um, it has a float in there that rises, uh, it's got a certain density and it rises uh, a certain amount based on how much uh, flow rate is being fed through. The rotameter that we were using was calibrated uh, to 
uh, 1.5 grams per second to 11.5 grams per second, which is about 0.02 uh, to about 0 0.033, if I remember correctly, pounds mass per second. When you were characterizing um, the flow rate and velocity profiles, how many samples did you did you take to establish, to establish flow distribution? Um, so the flow distribution, are you talking about across down the, uh, the honeycomb? Yes. So down the honeycomb, we took uh, nine different, uh, we took samples at nine different locations in Inch Park. Um, and we uh, took samples at a thousand samples per second for 30 seconds. Okay. Did you ever, did you ever try uh, stopping and restarting the system and remeasuring? Uh, no, we did not. Okay. Um, when you were going way back to the beginning, when you were estimating the thermal heat load due to uh, radiation, what were you assuming for your uh, emittance and absorption values? Um, we used just a flat one rate just so that all of our numbers would be the most conservative possible. Okay. Pressure at station three? Yeah. That would be right at the exit of the afterburner. And so that was the theoretical value. Is that static pressure or total pressure? Total pressure. So this is during the theoretical design. Okay, you're using, you're, you're measuring, you're measuring those? No, these were the total pressures at the exit after flame ignition, theoretically. So pressure, the maximum pressure, the total pressure at station three, which is the exit, 
and these are the theoretical values of what we would have been seeing during a live fire test. So for, for this section, we were going based off our theoretical values and what we should be seeing during the live fire portion of the test. So if we would have had live fire data, we would have been able to compare these values to the live fire data. Okay. So we used the pressure measurements at the exit of the blower and then said if these values were to remain and we were to get flame ignition, this is what our technical total pressure should be at the exit. Did, did you test the blower with back pressure from something like this and reject? Yes. Okay, so what was, what was the, did you, did you, uh, did you find a difference in, in the target weight? Um, so for the blowers, we did not directly measure the pressure, or I did not present slides directly on the pressure. However, the pressures were different than what was expected, and that's what creates the flow velocity being less than what was predicted. With, with the attachment on, you got less lower flow velocity. Yeah, you got two more. In right. So actually, um, I made a conservative guess that we'd have a lot more losses through the inlet and a lot more back pressure, creating a lower velocity. And actual after testing, we had a actual higher exit velocity than what I had predicted at the theoretical values. So as you can see, the dotted line is what we predicted when we did our calculations. After the losses running through the inlet, the diffusion, and the honeycomb, and the back pressures, but then when we measured it, it, it actually came out to being higher velocities than what was predicted. So the low is high, the first is what? So the low is the blue line and the high is the red line. So the low is the lowest setting on the blower and the high would be maximum uh, air coming out of the blower. Okay. And then the straight lines are your We were going to run it for several seconds with the fuel going and then ignite it. Once we had ignition, we would extract data for about 30 seconds and then run it for a minute afterwards just to cool everything off to get back to the room temperature and steady state. Okay. Troy did a lot more of that, so I'll pass it off to him to correct me on anything. So that's how long we anticipated testing for, and that's how it would affect the uh, materials. So that's how the heat transfer was done to ensure that all the parts would be allowed to be tested. The stainless steel is a 16 gauge, which is a little bit less than a 16th of an inch. So about 0.063 if I remember correctly. Okay. So you address every surface temperature that there except the tape. So it's run the thing for 30 seconds and back in the There were some of those. There was the data in which we received was from the manufacturer, and as we saw with the blower, that that's not necessarily trustworthy. The tape is simply there as a preventative measure, or in addition to, it's also considered a test consumable. So it was something that we were going to be checking in between each of the tests and replacing as necessary. And that makes sense to the taper as well. As you get warmer, the heat is going to wear out. Also, one of the comments that you did make though was because you're going to tape the bottom when it gets some leakage. So you're wearing the altitude rather than when you're something to consider for use. Okay. Yeah,
So a particle imaging thermosymmetry takes um, small particles that are about the same density as the fluid that you're using, and it sends it, or you insert those particles into the fluid, and they are captured by both a camera and a light source, so sometimes a laser, but in this case it was a light source uh, from either side of the test compartment. And so what happens is the camera captures um, the motion of the particles themselves and compiles uh, the, the motion itself into velocity vectors that then it averages out later. But since the camera was, or since that uh, area was shadowed out by the lane holders on either side, the camera couldn't um, take in enough light from that to accurately see what was going on in that section. And so it just gave data that was, um, if you go to the next slide, um, in that section you can see that there, the velocity is increasing according to our CFD but what the camera collected was that it was completely static in that section. So um, that's, that was just due to not, a light, not enough light coming back to the camera and uh, following the particles going through that section. So. Uh, 48, but it's more of a kind of generic question. So for velocity results, I didn't see a lot of discussion about some of these subsystem instrumentation setups constraints we couldn't build a full apparatus to test each of them so there's a top dead center middle dead center and bottom dead center so basically those are the three points along that line and we just took the pitot tube and held it at roughly the top middle and bottom and then changed the lower input depending on where we we're holding the pitot tube and then recorded the data that way So our big problem that we ran into was that, well, the first one was that the water jet kept breaking. Um, but after that, we ran into the problem of it's stainless steel, so it's harder than most things. So we couldn't weld a seam along. We had to just spot weld little bits to just tack it together. Um, we also had a problem of wanted to create holes for our instrumentation, so we had to try to use a drill press on stainless steel, which took a while. Um, and then warping due to the heat of the welding was a big problem. We had to try to like bend it back into shape a little bit to make sure everything would still fit itself together. Um, that was a big problem that we had. That's good. That's good. Good experience to have. Uh, let's see. Uh, a couple Points of clarification I may have missed on these. Um, uh, on your Reynolds number comparisons, uh, you had the water tunnel at uh, what about 1,500 and uh, live, uh, the live fire at about 10,000. Yeah. And you may have said it, but what was the uh, explanation behind the disparity between the two? Um, so that should be. It's um, yeah. So. One reason that they're different is, and this is what I was kind of struggling on when I stopped in the corner. The first part is that the 
velocity of the fluid flow is different for both tests. So in the live fire, we were expecting velocities between 15 and 30 inches per second and 24, 60 inches per second around that. And the water tunnel that we used was unable to, um, or the capabilities of it, those velocities did not um, correlate to any possible Reynolds number that would have matched the um, live fire tests. So I guess the first part would be the water tunnel capabilities were not good enough to match the velocities. Um, and then even if there were any disparities just based on like, oh, let's say the velocities could be the same, um, obviously characteristic length of the internal flow or of the what the flow is going through is different for um, any section that's not exactly the same dimensions. So the water tunnel was um, seven or 80 millimeters by uh, four millimeters tall. So that uh, characteristic length was extremely small in comparison to our eight by eight inch uh, flame holder at the So you had some rotations. Is there any way that you could have adjusted for or normalized for to try to make the, the numbers were truly comparable, given that you had those limitations? Um, not that I was able to find it in the semester. Maybe if I looked into it a little bit more. Okay, fair enough. And then the two pages ahead on 42. Uh, I, I believe that the conclusion that was stated was that uh, uh, PID testing confirmed the accuracy of the TFD. Elaborate a little bit more on on that statement. Um, so the most basic way of seeing it is that the behavior of the flow is very similar. Just taking out the fact that there could have been some inaccuracies in how we set up the PID test or in the actual testing of the PID, since it was an uh, actual physical test, um, the flow in itself is very similar to um, the flow that we uh, would have expected based on our CFD. And so from that, uh, we concluded that um, our PID tests and the behavior of the flow itself was enough to confirm that our CFD was. Were you satisfied with what you saw in the research relation though? Yes, I, yes, I. Uh, that's it, thanks. Okay, <clears throat> um, what's the purpose of honeycomb? You guys are all students in the workforce, right? Anybody? The purpose of the honeycomb is we weren't fully sure about how well the flow was developed or what type of vortices were coming out of the blower, so we wanted to get consistency from it. So we used the honeycomb to help promote laminar flow as well as remove or help remove any possible vortices coming into the burn engines. So is a honeycomb going to cause the flow to be less turbulent or more turbulent? Until you asked that question, I was going to assume less turbulent from what I looked up. Think about that. All right, also, Troy, I appreciate you making clear about the lines on the graph. That was You're welcome. Glad you guys were listening. Um, so, I have a question about the uh, CFD and the uh, um, velocity. I think it's a couple of slides before this. Um, there's a, a okay, um, slide 37. Let's see one more slide. So the assertion earlier was that the um, residence time for the uh, combustion and so the residence time is what you're calling the stay time. Uh, and then there's this chemical the kinetic delay that you have in there for the time for blow off. Um, so the assertion was that because the residence time was greater than the blow off time, that it would hold. But the, my recollection is the difference there is very, very small. Right? Yes. So first of all, what is that constant in the chemical kinetic delay for which you have? Like it's uh, 1.042, do you know what I mean? For the stay time? No, it's for the, the time to blow out. Oh, for the blowout? It was from a document outlining how they related geometry to blowout times. So it was like a correlation kind of thing? Basically. So basically what that document covered was 
if you were to do this real life, spend a lot of time on it, you would actually look at the chemistry and the total process. But if you wanted to make an assumption off of your expected velocities and geometry, this would be the best correlation. Yeah. Um, and that's not a problem. Not a problem with that. Just that these two numbers are one and a half milliseconds apart. Um, so if you take your CFE values and go back to the CFE results. Um, did you try to use the results of the CFE to check in the recirculation zone what the residence time would be? No, we did not. And why? Because we did not have enough time to then relate these two. I, I probably forgot to mention this, but if it makes any, uh, or probably made some difference, that I did not account for any change in temperature for my CFT itself, so it doesn't take into account like actually lighting our um, afterburner. It's it's more of a non-fire test. Yeah, but still, the global fluid mechanics of this, you would actually probably get a longer residence time if you look. That's the purpose of the flame holder. Um, so you know, it'd be interesting to see what you would have gotten out of there. Um, and just as a general, yeah, CFD makes great pretty pictures, but we don't have analytical results that you know are good. The CFD, you know, I'm not sure. <coughs> All right, so I've got one more question. It's about the PIB. Um, if you go to the, the video page of the PIB, do you know what the frame rate of the camera that you were using is? Um, I I do not remember exactly what it was. I uh, I remember that we learned which one it was. I can't remember. <coughs> My concern here is the size of the bubbles. Oh, that, you know, I, okay. I feel like the size of the bubbles is too big for what you're representing. Okay. Um, well, there are two two things that happen. First, um, so this calibration test was actually taken um, before we sanded our bubbles, and so the bubbles that were created were definitely due or a, a, a lot of them were due to imperfections in the surface of our models, and that's why we had to sand them down. Where does your model start in this picture? It is, oh, uh, here. So it is about right there. Okay, so what about the bubbles upstream that appear to be very large? Um, well, my concern, I mean, so my concern that, here is that the bubbles are larger than what you're trying to represent in your results. Right, remember that we can't represent anything that's more than, you know, the Ny Nyquist-Salem theorem. Yeah. So spatial resolution has to be twice the size of the bubble. So it's something to think of when you're presenting stuff like this. So it's uh, <coughs> always want to make sure that you have that kind of thing buttoned down. But this was great. I really like that you guys took this project and presented it in this way. This was, I, I think this is great. Um, so again, like we all said, great job, good presentation. Uh, Justin and Dylan, go check on you. Yes, and I think that's the trickiest part. Um, so you tell me, you show us about heat transfer. Um, heat transfer from what to what? That was the heat transfer from the recirculation zone or the beginning of it to the entrance of the inlet. The reason this was chosen is just to drop. The reason this was chosen is just to be the most conservative, assume that that recirculation is a heat wall, so that it felt would be more conservative, as well as the inlet, because it had the lowest surface temperature of all of our materials. So you're calculating heat transfer from the gas to the honeycomb? Slightly past the honeycomb, but yes, sir. So that, that plane via radiation could so that was the one that. And when you said convection, were you, how was that heat transfer? The cooling or the heat? I assume that the convection heat transfer you're talking about is again from the recirculation zone to the end. Both going the other way, so clearly it's not directly from convection. So elaborate on how that heat transfer is traveling from both. As we looked at 
as we looked at it, that that raised the inlet's temperature very, very little. Also, we consider that negligible. My question is, what is the motor transfer? What's the path? Induction. Yes, I wrote down the wrong thing and misspoke. Thank you for correcting me. that are on this slide are BTU versus, yes, BTU. So for how much time does it be? This is considering steady state. Right now, so. Oh, <laughs> 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 